uh, good evening, everyone. Um, dear professors, uh, dear professor, <laughs> dear speakers, dear guests, dear all who are joining us here in person and dear all who are joining us here online uh, through our Facebook live stream. Good evening and welcome to all tonight's uh, panel discussion entitled The Implications of the AUKUS Deal on European Defence and Security, organized by the um, Society of International Security of the Vienna School of International Studies. Um, under my position as the president of the society and as a graduate student here at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna, and uh, my name is also Fotini Zaroyani, uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all here uh, tonight. Uh, before proceeding to an introduction to today's uh, subject matter and topic of our discussion and to our speakers' um, uh, biographies and backgrounds, uh, let me firstly extend a big thank you to the Centre for Britain and Europe at the, of the University of Surrey for supporting um, uh, and for uh, helping us with tonight's event, as we have two, uh, two of our speakers being affiliated to the Centre for Britain and Europe, Professor Hadfield and Professor Say. Thank you very much to the Centre and to the University of Surrey. And let me also briefly introduce our society, the Society of International Security. So as um, I mentioned, it's a student society operating under the Diplomatic Academy Student Initiative. And um, it's a student organized and student based. As I mentioned, I'm a graduate student of the Diplomatic Academy. Uh, and as its name suggests, it actually aims at bringing uh, students of the Diplomatic Academy closer to international peace and security related issues. And uh, our general goal and aim is to bridge the gap between graduate students and young scholars and with the whole academia world and also the practitioners world. And we aim to do so through the organization of several events that include panel discussions like tonight or roundtable discussions or Q and A's with practitioners, diplomats, um, or um, workers in international non-governmental organizations, etc., or visits to international institutions here in Vienna. And uh, today's uh, event is no exception to, to this effort of ours. Um, in this respect, a big thank you goes to my board, Vasiliki Andreoulaki and Salomet Bali, for joining us here tonight. Um, thank you very much for all your help. And also a big thank you goes to Alexander, who, has, who is joining us uh, tonight via Zoom for a member, an esteemed member of our society for helping us organize and go through tonight's event. Um, a special thank you also must go to Dr. Madalina Dobrescu, a PhD fellow here at the Diplomatic Academy, who under normal circumstances would have joined us here today as another panelist, but unfortunately health reasons did not allow us to proceed with that, but we thank her for her support to our organization and our event. So moving on to the subject matter of today's uh, panel discussion, as I mentioned, the title is Implications of the AUKUS deal on uh, European defense and security. And just to give a really brief background, the AUKUS deal is a strategic defense alliance by, signed by Australia, the UK and the US, hence its catchy name, AUKUS, uh, in September 2021. Uh, it contains provisions for the acquisitions of nuclear powered submarines by Australia with the help of the UK and the US. Uh, while its main purpose and content focuses on a close cooperation between the three um, signing parties uh, in the Indo Pacific region. Um, from the moment of its signature, as we all know, and we follow the headlines in the newspapers, the world has actually been sitting at the edge of its seat with the implications that it has brought to the fore. Uh, France actually recalled its ambassadors from the respective countries, the UK, the US and Australia, viewing AUKUS as a really major blow to both European and French security policy, especially in light of the cancelled uh, French-Australian deal on submarines. Others in Europe have raised their eyebrows at yet another bullet point being added to the European uh, secure strategic autonomy um, debate and discourse. And we now see the revival of the European security debate as being a reality that we cannot oversee from this day onwards. Uh, on the other hand, China has perceived the deal as directly aimed against it, rendering a discussion on AUKUS inextricably linked with the US and China struggle, and of course, with the, um, with the hotspot of the South China Sea. And this is only the surface of the implications of the deal and what the deal actually helps us discuss and analyze. 
And for this purpose, we have managed to bring together quite a strong um, and quite an interesting panel, uh, if uh, you allow me to say. Joining us here is, in person is Professor Dr. Clemens Fischer, mm -hmm. uh, Minister Plenipotentiary at the Permanent Representation of Austria to the European Union, a member of the Faculty of Management, Economics and Social Sciences, and Professor of International Relations at the University of Cologne in Germany, and Professor of Geopolitics here at the Diplomatic Academy, of course, there are many other things I could add to the title, but I have to keep it short. Sorry, Professor. <laughs> Thank you for joining us in person. Um, he will give us a bird's eye view, an overview of uh, AUKUS deal and its repercussions or the issues that uh, it raises, focusing especially on France's connection to the issue. Joining us from the UK via Zoom is Professor Jane C. A uh, visiting professor of strategy and security of the Strategy and Security Institute at the University of Exeter in the UK, and member of the group of uh, strategic advisors of the NATO Special Operation Forces at SAPE in Belgium. Thank you very much, Professor, for joining us here tonight. Uh, he will focus on the NATO aspect as well as on the implications for and role of the Indo Pacific region. <coughs> also joining us from the UK, again via Zoom, is Professor Dr. Amelia Hatfield. Dean International and Head of the Department of Politics and Director of the Center for Britain and Europe I mentioned before at the University of Surrey. Thank you very much, Professor, for joining us tonight. She will focus on the revival of the European security debate that we mentioned and on the submarines related questions raised by the AUKUS deal. And uh, last but definitely not least, joining us from Brussels is Mr. Dylan Maccherini Croson, a research assistant at the EU Foreign Policy Unit at the Center for European Policy Studies, also known as CEPS, and holding a master's in European Affairs from Sciences Po in Paris. Thank you very much, Mr. Croson, for joining us here tonight as well. Uh, he will focus on the European strategic autonomy discourse, the challenges it currently faces and prospects it bears for the future, as well as, again, on a general commentary on the AUKUS deal and its implications. So let's have a round of applause for this great panel. So I will, before, uh, without further ado, I will pass the floor to Professor Fischer to start the discussion and just to inform you after all four speakers have proceeded with some opening remarks, we will open the floor for a question and answer session, both for the audience in person and for the virtual audience. So you will have a chance to also participate in the discussion and we highly recommend you to, to participate, of course. So Professor Fischer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. First of all, a very good evening to all of us here in the room and to those who are following on, 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 on live stream. But before I go uh, into the matter, uh, may I congratulate you to having organized the evening because uh, we do know the situation in particular uh, regarding COVID is not the easiest one and you still managed to drag us all in here in the room. Um, and um, therefore, um, I bow my head for, for everything you do as a student here because we do know as teachers um, how much we ask you to do and, and you still have part of your free time um, you're putting in these things and, and um, therefore thank you very much for letting us join today. Um, when we come to the AUKUS incident and you asked me to give a kind of bird view, I think I will try to do what diplomats are, should be good in, not to make more enemies uh, by, by defining what has happened. And if it would be that tragic, we should all smile because this AUKUS incident has every ingredient you do need for a second grade spy novel. You have agents in the dark. You have a menage a trois no one knew before happened. You have a lost love affair by the French, which are good and everywhere. Um, you have revenge, you have retaliation, you have confessions. Uh, it reminds me of the latest Bond movie. We all pray that Bond comes back, but there's no happy end by the moment. And I don't want to take my, my, my last word at the beginning, but there's no happy end with the AUKUS deal because there's no winner. No one will win with that. Because what we have all lost is trust and confidence in partnerships, in friendships, in old alliances. And this is what happened with the AUKUS deal. Of course, no one can blame the Australians. Uh, to go for the best available technique, for the best equipment, uh, for uh, the most suitable defense alliance. You can't blame that for that. And you can't blame the British being ready to deliver it. And by the way, if rumor goes, and then we don't know, 
France possibly hasn't even fully fulfilled their contract, which we don't know because I'm not reading every SMS that's going around the globe, which is not so by the moment anyway, it's very dangerous. Um, and you can't blame the Australians for seeking powerful and reliable partners. And you can't blame the Americans and the British to offer that alliance. And one can only hope for Australia that they will be as reliable as they think they are by the moment. But what one really can question is the way matters have been dealt with. There could have been ways to save a face, but no one was interested in that. And this is the most tragic thing because we shall never forget we are talking about brothers in arms, members of the same alliance. We are not talking about uh, two countries being on the other side of the fence. No, no, they are together in NATO. They are together in answers and wherever you, 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 can, uh, you can get it. We have a transatlantic partnership. We always revoke every single day uh, in front of the altar of friendship. But now it goes down to business. So this is what, what, what one can blame all of them for. And there's yet another collateral damage. And, and I, I'm absolutely sure that, that Jamie won't only talk about NATO, uh, but Jamie, is, as far as uh, I, I know, you, you will talk about uh, the ASEAN uh, community too, and what's going on in the Pacific region. Because ASEAN was called seemingly fully unaware what is happening in front of their doorstep. And the same, by the way, might apply to answers. So, and this doesn't give a lot of reliability for regional organizations. It's not, if they don't know what's happening in front of their doorstep, who shall? And furthermore, it's not only a regional affair in, 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 the, in, in the Pacific region. It doesn't come as a surprise that, the, that France does take such a, a rough stance towards the British in the post-Brexit fishery dispute, getting a ship, taken in the harbor, not releasing it. Uh, it's like when you, when you park your car wrongly and, and they take your car and, and, and uh, say, this is a major defense, which is not, by the way. But in that way, the, the French carried the waves exactly to the opposite, to the shores of the opposite side of the globe. So this has really repercussions no one would have thought be so possibly. And again, you can blame all the powers for that even, because you should know what you do. In particular, in such a, a delicate situation as the Indo-Pacific, where no one knows what's, what's exploding the very next day. Currently, I don't see, as I've said at the very beginning, I don't see any winner in the situation because Australia might have found a strong and, as I've said, hopefully reliable partner because never knows uh, which administration is dealing with which case. But Australia might go down in history as an unreliable business partner because we don't talk about peanuts. We talk about a lot of money. And we talk about working places, we talk about reliability, and we talk about logistical lines. And not only for one year, we talk about five, 10, 15 years. Secondly, both the UK and the US have shown a robust, a very robust commitment to the Indo-Pacific region. But at the same time, they have risked to, to offend their partners in NATO, in the EU, in ANSYS, and in ASEAN. That means they simply didn't care what happens there. That means the first goal to become kind of dominant partner of Australia. This doesn't mean the question of partnership with Australia is fine, but that's not the point. The point is you are there and you are invited and you are there with your submarines and you're there with military forces. And that's the point for the Americans. And for the Brits, it does show we don't need the Europeans. We are better off which is again a blow for the Europeans because we prayed every single day that Brexit goes down badly for the Brits because they have lost Valhall. They have lost friendship, the family. Now they should suffer. They don't suffer because they have a new partner and they go to the Indo-Pacific and show us how it works. Thirdly, France is unfortunately humiliated and even ridiculed in the eyes of the international community um, because France didn't even realize what's going on behind her back or even worse in front of their eyes. Uh, so why should you deal with them? And this is not only a blow against France, this is a blow against the Europeans because uh, it did give us a blow because we, we tried to establish something like a strategy for the Indo-Pacific and the dream is over before we started dreaming it even. So this is a setback for years. Um, 
and furthermore, uh, even when they go to New York, to the United Nations, France is the last remaining asset of the Europeans in the World Security Council, a ridiculed one. The Brits are still there, but on their own account, not for the Europeans. And the only sentence I would like to, to, to issue on, on the European internal affairs, one should never forget we do have presidential elections next year in France. France takes over the rotating presidency of the European Union on the 1st of, of, of January. And Monsieur Macron has already established, uh, together with Mrs. von der Leyen, um, a security, uh, the Defense Council, a defense conference. Big thing, popular thing. Uh, and now, who wants to be part of that? Because uh, why do I want to have a blind partner? And the Europeans haven't had any answer on that. So whether France can maintain its claim to, to leadership, we don't know. But it could end in a protracted battle about leadership in Europe. We don't know even uh, what happened in Germany with the, with the government. But what I've read today in Reuters was, was quite astonishing. Uh, this possibly in or potentially incoming uh, coalition wants to boil down the German Bundeswehr down to 180,000 soldiers. This means they are even smaller in the army than Poland at the end which is uh, not a question of, of, of figures, but as a matter of fact, it's a symbol when you boil down your armed forces like that. And last but not least, I haven't mentioned China and Russia so far, and I won't do it because uh, my, 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 my fellow panelists uh, have, uh, have, 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 I think, uh, as far as I've seen, prepared a lot about that. But I don't see China or Russia as being unsolid winners. They might have their sardonic smile in their face, um, seeing the cracks within the partnership of the Western alliances. But they are now confronted with a very strong defense alliance in front of their shores. When they go up for the Russians, uh, they have the Japanese, um, which, with whom they are still um, are not in a state of war, but uh, that's the truth. Um, and uh, you have the, the Americans and the, um, and the Brits now having a right to be there because they are part of, and sorry, possibly I'm wrong, but the submarine deal is one thing. I do think that the, the alliance of the UK, of Australia and the US in defense affairs, this is the most striking thing, because whether you have the submarine or not, that might sink, but the alliance still stays. So um, my, my last sentence is, sim is very simple. If we are not able to close our ranks and make damage control quite as quick as possible, the cracks will widen, the gaps will widen, and the so-called uh, common defense and, and, and foreign policy of the European Union will suffer even more. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this bird's eye view. As we mentioned, I think it was really insightful and it really set the ground for, for the next uh, uh, speakers. Uh, Professor, say without further ado, the, the floor is to you and for your remarks. Well, uh, Fatini, uh, thanks very much. Uh, really delighted to be invited. As Amelia knows very well, when I left NATO three years ago, a friendly ambassador gave me a piece of advice. He said, Jamie, for the rest of your long life, you have to do nice things with nice people in, in nice places. And uh, uh, Amelia acted on that immediately by offering me a visiting professorship at Surrey, uh, which uh, I've greatly enjoyed. And I must say that my favorite place in Vienna for many years was nothing less than the Favoritenstrasse, the home of the Diplomatic Academy, because uh, I've had some wonderful experiences there. So thank you for allowing me to combine two of my great loves uh, in one single session um, and for being able to participate in the debate this evening. Um, I, I would like to sort of make five brief points uh, about uh, AUKUS, uh, if I may. I'm aware that, you know, the French philosopher Pascal once uh, apologized that if he had more time, he would have written a shorter letter. But I'll try to boil this down into the shortest Pascalian letter uh, that I possibly can. Uh, point number one is you unfortunately should never base alliances on 
arms deals. Uh, I've been around for a long time, 38 years in NATO, and arms deals never brought NATO together. Uh, we've had a, a whole series, as you know, of clashes. Uh, the French were elbowed out of a helicopter deal with Poland uh, a few years ago, uh, with the US uh, selling a Black Hawks instead. The French were forced to give up a very lucrative deal with Russia uh, on Mistral uh, um, uh, ship uh, shore. Uh, uh, carriers. Uh, they eventually managed to sell them to uh, Egypt. Uh, the Europeans thought a couple of years ago they had a wonderful tanker deal uh, with Airbus tankers for the United States, only to be elbowed out in favor of Boeing by the US Congress. Uh, uh, there's a great uh, deal of animosity at the moment with Turkey over the purchases of Russian weapons, particularly uh, the S-400s. I could carry on, but the point I'm trying to make is that this is always a cutthroat business, uh, even among uh, allies. There's no charity when these mega dollar uh, contracts uh, are at stake. You never know that you've actually got the money or the contract before you've delivered the weapons and the first checks have arrived uh, in the uh, post. Uh, the only uh, uh, salve, if you like, for the bruised French uh, pride, which uh, Ambassador Fisher uh, referred to, is of course the fact that the French have been able to sell the Rafale uh, aircraft to the Greeks, to the Indians, uh, frigates to the Greeks in recent months. It doesn't quite compensate for the uh, 36 odd uh, billion euros that they will lose on the short fin Barracuda sales, uh, but uh, nonetheless it helps uh, a little bit. And maybe you know the French will be successful at selling uh, their uh, 12 uh, short fin Barracudas that they were hoping to sell to the Australians, to India, or to one of their other partner countries uh, instead. So I make no apologies for this, but I'm just sort of pointing out that you never want to build an alliance uh, on uh, weapon sales because those alliances would not last very long. That's the first point. Second point, the consequences for uh, UK foreign policy, because yes, um, uh, the British uh, were very much behind uh, the AUKUS deal. Uh, it was the uh, incoming British Chief of Defence, uh, uh, Admiral Tony uh, Radekin, uh, who first sort of spotted the opening uh, that the Australians might be rethinking the deal with France in favour of nuclear power submarines and got the US and the UK governments uh, in, 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 in involved. Um, and of course, this is a sign of the new post-Brexit, again, Ambassador Fisher mentioned this, British tilt towards the uh, Indo-Pacific. It's not just about AUKUS, it's also the fact that in its integrated review of foreign policy and defence published last March, uh, the UK government already foresaw the establishment of a military headquarters in Australia, the uh, rotational positioning uh, of a uh, special forces or Royal Marines uh, expeditionary uh, British force carrying out training with the Australians and the uh, Americans, the technological as well as intelligence sharing between Australia and the UK has a long history. And of course, the AUKUS deal was announced at the time when the new British aircraft carrier, the QE2, with a, a task force with Americans on board the aircraft carrier and US and Dutch ships participating in the task force was on its maiden voyage to the Taiwan Strait uh, and to the uh, South China Sea in, in, in particular. So the UK will claim that this was not a bolt from from the blue, but was also part of a kind of new tilt uh, to the Indo-Pacific, uh, with the Brits, for example, now uh, are planning to keep two ships permanently deployed in the region, uh, presumably at Singapore, um, that was, you know, in the pipeline for some time already. The interesting thing, I think, here, and this is my point too, is that whether the UK is really going to be able to sustain this commitment. Number one, uh, is AUKUS going, to, AUKUS going to be more than just a submarine deal? We wait to see. Uh, the Brits here in London London have talked it up as the beginning of a new strategic partnership, which is going to cover AI, cyber defense, military training, military deployments, uh, exercises, uh, the Five Eyes intelligence sharing arrangement that's already in place. We wait to see if this is going to happen. If it's just a submarine deal, not much is going to happen, ladies and gentlemen, because those submarines will not be ready for at least 20 years. 
Um, and uh, so we wait to see. Uh, but the UK is under pressure because the integrated review also makes clear that Russia and NATO, not the Indo-Pacific, not AUKUS, are the UK's number one priority. And there is already an immense demand within NATO on British maritime capabilities. The UK has deployed over the last 12 months in the Barents Sea. It's deployed in the Black Sea. And you saw that a British frigate got into deep trouble almost with the Russians uh, patrolling off the coast of Crimea recently. Um, the, the animosity, the confrontation with Russia makes the transatlantic sea lanes of communication. Remember all those convoys of World War I and World War II, massively more important. So the UK Maritime Command now has additional maritime responsibilities with the United States to keep those sea lanes of communication open in crisis or wartime uh, from Russian naval forces and Russian submarines. Uh, the UK has also deployed in the Baltic Sea. Uh, it's part of the standing maritime uh, task forces. And the Royal Navy at the moment only consists of 19 ships. Not very many uh, when it comes to sustaining a simultaneous presence, both in Indo-Pacific as well as NATO, the Atlantic. The Brits are going to have to choose. They can't really do both. Interestingly, just a couple of days ago, the outgoing chief of the defense staff, General Sinek Carter, was in Washington. And I followed one of his sort of a Zoom conversations. And, and he said, look, you know, we, we've sent the QE2 for a, a demonstration voyage to the Indo-Pacific, but we're not going to be able to do it every year. We just don't have the money. Uh, we're going to have to do it maybe every three, every, every, every four years. So uh, the sustainability of the tilt to the Indo-Pacific at a time when the Brits, uh, having left the EU as ambassador, Asset official pointed out, are very keen to double down on NATO for their military role in Europe. The capacity to sustain both these uh, commitments, uh, open question mark. Okay, that's point two. Let's move on to point three. Point three is that AUKUS sort of raises a lot of questions uh, about the Indo-Pacific, which is what is the point that we continue to multiply uh, incoherent uh, piecemeal security arrangements that don't, unlike the jigsaw puzzle, fit together. It's very interesting. A couple of weeks after the AUKUS deal was announced, uh, the uh, the um, uh, Secretary of the, the Army in, in, in the UK, the junior minister, was in Kuala Lumpur revitalizing uh, the Commonwealth Five Power Pact, which involves Singapore, New Zealand, not part of AUKUS, um, uh, and Malaysia. Uh, uh, this was built around the notion of dealing with fisheries, uh, dealing with piracy, the environment, regional uh, issues. Uh, New Zealand, uh, which has been part of the ANZUS Pact and is a long-standing UK ally, is not part of AUKUS. The UK and the US have both set up bilateral dialogues with ASEAN. This was uh, mentioned. The Quad has been formed, which had a summit meeting at the White House uh, on, in, on the back of the UN General Assembly recently, which is India, uh, Australia, uh, 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 Japan and the United States, France and the UK, Germany not yet involved. Uh, EU countries, and I'm sure that uh, Amelia and Dylan are going to talk about this later, have also been sending ships to the region. Even Belgium, where I live, normally uh, has had a frigate. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, Germany, with the Bavaria recently being refused uh, entry into a Chinese uh, port. France, don't forget, France is the only Indo-Pacific power uh, in Europe. It has uh, three million French citizens living in four Pacific territories and 7,000 French troops there uh, all at once. So in short, we've got a proliferation of initiatives, some more dealing with deterrence against China, some more hard power military, some more cooperative security, soft power, you know, deal with the common sort of issues. But this is not NATO. This is not the OSCE. This is not the EU. In other words, it doesn't add up to a coherent sort of security arrangement for the region. And it doesn't answer fundamental questions, which is, are we going to defend Taiwan? Uh, Biden said yes, but then was rolled back by his staff on this. Uh, recently, the US position remains strategic ambiguity. Are we uh, going to defend Japan? Well, a Russian and Chinese task force south, just south of the Hokkaido Island in Japan recently. Are we going to defend South Korea for more than an attack from North Korea and so on? Is this going to be an Anglo-Saxon arrangement, excluding the Asians? Uh, and it was rightly pointed out by Ambassador Fisher that uh, countries like Malaysia and Indonesia have reacted 
of Vietnam uh, quite lukewarmly about AUKUS. So I don't have any fundamental objection to AUKUS if we actually understand what it really is beyond a submarine deal, but it doesn't answer the fundamental question about how do we put in a coherent set of arrangements for the region that deals with the fundamental security uh, issues, whether they be containment of China or deterrence of attack. Uh, and therefore, uh, basically, that effort is still lacking. If the Europeans are going to be associated with this, which structure are they going to join? Is it going to be an association with ASEAN, an association with ANZUS, an association with AUKUS, an association with the UK Five Power uh, Pact, uh, an association with the Quad? What? Um, we still need transatlantic strategic thinking on this uh, issue. Thirdly, and this will be addressed, I know, by Amelia and Dylan, so I'll be short. But it was the irony, of course, that uh, AUKUS was announced on the very, very day that the European Union announced its new Indo-Pacific strategy. Now, this is amazing uh, for me as a former diplomat, uh, because the US and the EU have been working consistently since the uh, inception of the Biden administration to try to come up with a joint approach to the Indo-Pacific and China. Uh, the EU and the US uh, when Tony Blinker was in Brussels, have set up an EU-China Council. There's the Trade and Technology Council, You all, uh, where they're going to try jointly to work on the tech challenge from China and, and the search for uh, global uh, standards. They've agreed on a kind of three C's approach of you know, co cooperation where possible, but also competition and where necessary confrontation or pushback uh, and, and, and the rest. And the idea was that you know, it only made sense for the United States to obviously give up the old Trump doctrine of a unilateral approach to China that was not going anywhere and try to form a broad coalition. And the Europeans have made the big gestures, big gestures to Washington in order to facilitate this, agreeing to sanctions against Chinese officials involved in the Uyghur repression, agreeing to embargo products from China, like solar panels that are made with false Uyghur labor. The European Parliament has been sanctioned the EU even put on hold, and the US wanted this, uh, the uh, agreement, a comprehensive uh, uh, pack, uh, trade uh, uh, agreement that it negotiated with Beijing. So it's surprising that the EU, having bent over backwards to adopt a much more realistic approach to China, then suddenly it sees that the US goes in a different direction on the very day that the India-Pacific strategy is adopted. I basically think that this is a failure of American foreign policy, frankly, at the very important moment because clearly the two sides have to work together. The next implication uh, is European defense and I'm not going to mention it because I could talk about it for many hours. Other speakers are going to address it but will this be that wake-up call for European strategic autonomy which has been uh, mentioned? Uh, uh, we NATO by the way is the product of a crisis in the Pacific uh, 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 Korea in 1950, rather than a crisis in Europe, and will paradoxically the defense of Europe uh, be born uh, not in Mali uh, or Kosovo or Bosnia or even on the border between Belarus and Poland at the moment, but the result of a crisis in the Pacific? I don't know. Uh, the jury is still out, but we'll have to wait and see if the uh, if the irritation with lack of consultation by the United States, the impact of Brexit, and the U. UK leaving the EU and going off in a different direction, not being interested in institutional security arrangements with the EU. If Macron is going to have enough ammunition uh, to go with this uh, and make the case for European strategic autonomy, or if after a period of anger that we've seen so often in the past, um, the uh, EU is going to lapse back into topper. Uh, the basis uh, a year or so ago for European strategic autonomy was animus vis-a-vis -vis Trump. Then Biden came along and the Europeans said oh we don't really need this any longer because now we have Biden committing to NATO and we have a much more US uh, friendly uh, policy uh, but uh, Macron's going to have to make the argument that uh, European strategic autonomy is needed as much with friendly US administrations even if they can be irritating from time to time as with hostile US administrations because even a friendly US government will have sufficient differences with Europe for example the tilt to Asia, differences vis-a-vis -vis China, that necessitate we having our own voice. So will European strategic autonomy be born in Melbourne 
or Canberra, sorry, that's the capital, and Kabul, uh, whereas we always believed that it was going to be sort of built in uh, Sarajevo or, or Moscow. Let's see. Finally, it's all about containing China. I agree. But if you want to contain China, you need to do four things. You need to deal with the tech challenge. Does AUKUS provide an answer to that? You need to deal with the deterrence challenge, which is not provoking China. Deterrence is not about provocation. It's about sort of a balance of reassurance about your intentions, uh, about uh, engagement, about diplomacy, but also about hard power. Does it really solve that issue? The third issue is economic interdependence. Uh, it's paradoxical that America is building military relationships in Asia while refusing to join the Asian trade arrangements after Trump uh, uh, abrogated the TTP on his first day in office. And can you have an effective uh, balance of power in the Asia Pacific and effective security structure if the US is very keen to do military things in the region, but is not keen to join the regional trade packs? It's a paradox that America doesn't want to join the CP, uh, CPTTP, which is the successor to the TTP, but Taiwan and China have both applied to join that organization. And finally, uh, you have to engage China. You have to talk to China. Biden apparently is going to have a video with President Xi finally next week. We know this. You have to cooperate with China. All eyes are on the COP26 at the moment. Uh, uh, we need to pull China into cooperative arrangements and not exclude it. How does AUKUS answer that question? So the AUKUS test is what does it do to move us forward on the four key things, technology, deterrence, economic interdependence, and engagement with China? Thanks very much indeed. That's my initial contribution. And I will stay quiet and listen uh, to the speakers that follow. Thanks very much again for giving me the platform this evening. Thank you very much, Professor, for for your remarks. And even though the previous two speakers, Professor Sam and Professor Fisher, actually uh, downplayed a little bit the submarines question, I think that Professor Hadfield will enlighten us on the submarines aspect. I think you have to hear what Sue wants to say. So, Professor, the floor is to you. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a tremendous uh, pleasure to be here. And can I, uh, like uh, Professor Fisher, commend the Student Society. Uh, all too often, uh, Student Societies um, uh, I focus a bit too much on being students, but but you guys have been uh, tremendously focused on engaging uh, with one of the key issues, I think, in international relations. So so well done. I'm just sorry that I can't join you in, in beautiful Vienna um, in person. I think uh, Dylan coming after me is is probably going to cover quite a bit of the um, the European uh, aspect. And in fact, I think it's been quite, quite nicely laid out. Um, so I'd like to talk about one or two other things, um, but suffice to say that I think AUKUS has, has very much uh, rattled some uh, some cages. Uh, we know that the EU is drafting at this point its, its strategic compass um, for release uh, next year, and that's certainly meant to give more direction uh, to its defense efforts. So I think a reasonable question to ask is, uh, what does AUKUS do to, to the, those defense um, ambitions? We also know that uh, in terms of updating, uh, NATO too is busy updating its own strategic uh, concept co concurrently, um, and we've seen a variety of, of, of gestures back and forth on this. Um, I would very much agree with um, some of the key points that uh, that Jamie has made uh, before me um, and and also pr particularly Professor Fisher who started with the, the 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 excellent axiom of don't make more enemies that's that's very much I think at the heart of almost every sort of uh, di diplomatic um, endeavor yes I'd like to talk very briefly I'm not in any sense an expert on this but uh, about the hardware because we're talking all about the submarines um, why why particularly are we looking at the at the shift um, from old rattly diesel uh, submarines to nuclear powered submarines can we just be very clear the submarines are nuclear powered they do not contain nuclear uh, weapons this is important because uh, Australia itself is a non-nuclear state uh, which puts it in a slightly unusual position I think to, to, to some degree uh, and this may be somewhere where the 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 UK in, in particular and hopefully the US uh, can give it a, a degree of guidance so what are the what are the pros and cons if you like um, of, of going with nuclear powered uh, submarines eight of which are going to be built under the AUKUS deal in Adelaide um, well um, the, the pluses are of course no refueling um, with diesels, of course, there's a tremendous amount of refueling and you have to do so very, very uh, uh, frequently. Uh, the nuclear powered submarines actually can circumnavigate uh, the globe 20 times. 
uh, without refueling, and that's incredibly important. So if you have a look at the um, the land mass and of course the sea mass of this of uh, South China Sea um, and uh, the A Asian Pacific. Uh, maritime spread as a whole, uh, there's a tremendous amount of scope uh, for, for putting these to sea and keeping them uh, there for a long, long time. Uh, endurance, again, I think is another major um, advantage. Um, just in terms, and this will please the uh, physicists among you, of the amount of enriched uranium that you get on these boats. Um, in terms of the enriched uranium you, you need for um, a, a nuclear weapon, you're looking at about 90%. Uh, what you're going to find on the submarines is closer to 20. Um, so there's a there's a there's a big big difference. So for people sort of suggesting that they're Chernobyl's at sea, I, I just I don't think that's at all accurate. They're also a good deal faster. They're larger, which means you can crew them more, uh, more effectively. Um, and also the fact that there are far fewer moving parts means they're much much quieter. So they are a stealth weapon, and that's very much at the heart I think of the uh, of the deterrence structure there. What are the drawbacks? Obviously, they're they're hellish expensive, um, and they take an awfully long time to build. I think Jamie was exactly right about this. They, they're they're certainly going to take at least two decades, maybe more. Um, on the other, I've I've said larger larger is also a bit of a drawback actually because it does make them even if they're quieter easier to spot. Um, so there's a bit of an issue there. Um, I've mentioned uranium. What happens with the spent uranium once they dock? Uh, so you've got you've got an issue with regards uh, to safety there. Uh, there's issues on board with regards to accidents, uh, because an accident on, on a nuclear powered submarine is going to be far more profound or likely to be far more profound, perhaps than on an electric or a diesel or, or a hybrid. Um, so there are certainly those to bear in mind. There are six countries who currently operate uh, nuclear uh, powered submarines. I, I should do a starter for 10 CFR. Uh, our student society knows all six. I'm sure they do. But of course, it's the United States and, and the UK and France. Um, and then on the other side, India, China uh, and Russia. So Australia will be the seventh um, um, joining that select group. And again, the only member of that group that, as I mentioned before, doesn't uh, possess uh, nuclear weapons. Um, so that does put it, I think, to some degree in a bit of a sticky uh, situation. So I think those are those are issues. Uh, there are safeguards issues um, that need to be built in to the AUKUS deal. And there are uh, non-proliferation measures as well. Um, and this is going to involve people like the IAEA, for example, um, who need to be very, very sure. Um, Australia has already made very clear that this is not going to lead uh, to, to civilian uh, nuclear development at all. Um, and again, of course, this is the this is the issue with the, the, a real shift I think in terms of what Australia is is, is trying to do. Um, so the timing, as we has been mentioned before, is, is incredibly significant. Uh, it, it came a month after the US exit uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, doubts have been raised, I think, in, in multiple quarters uh, about US commitment in the region. Uh, we also know, as Jamie uh, pointed out, that Britain is very, very eager to be much more involved in the Asia Pacific. We've seen this in the integrated review. Uh, and I think we've seen this in a concentrated form, really, because of the, the exit from the European Union. Um, and I think also, you know, within that sort of circle of anxiety, Australia is, is increasingly concerned about, about China's influence. Um, so that's a really big deal, I think. I think it suggests that all three nations are, um, they're, drawing, they're drawing a line in the sand. Uh, and I think they're drawing it together to try to counter the Chinese uh, Communist Party's uh, aggressive moves uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And I think it, there's a very public demonstration here um, about this combined stance um, and the attempt, I think, to see AUKUS as a way to uh, lead to a stable and secure Indo-Pacific region. There's a deep irony here because, of course, the, the stable and secure Indo-Pacific region has led to the prosperity uh, of many in the region, including China, uh, China's economic growth. Uh, so there is a bit of a sort of a, a, a circle here, which is, is a little uncomfortable if you, if, you, if you follow it all the way around. Um, so the agreement itself involves the sharing of information and technology. Uh, it's not just about building submarines, it's actually sort of mapping out the, the, the information sharing and the tech, including AI, uh, that you need in order to be able to get as far uh, down the, the, the line as the hardware. And it's also a sharing of intelligence and quantum technology. Now, the United States doesn't do this. The, the last people that they shared any sort of technology with was Britain in 1958. Um, exactly on this area. And this was long before the, the advance of sort of high intelligence and quantum technology. Um, the AUKUS deal also includes the acquisition of, of cruise missiles. I don't know if that's sort of made the press, but this is a key part of it as well. But certainly the nuclear submarines are, are key. 
Um, so again, as I've mentioned, they're going to be built in Adelaide in South Australia, and they will involve uh, the US and the UK providing consultation uh, on technology for their production. Um, so obviously the nuclear submarines have, have in, enormous uh, defense capabilities and huge ramifications uh, for the regions. As I've mentioned before, they're much more uh, stealthy uh, than, than conventional ones. Um, the problem is, of course, it's going to take a long time, not just to build them, but Australia itself has a lack of nuclear infrastructure. So they really are starting from scratch. Um, and again, uh, Australia's Prime Minister Scott Morrison made very clear that Australia is not seeking to acquire nuclear weapons. It's not seeking to establish a civil nuclear capability. So, the, I mean, there may be real questions as, as to, you know, the, the anchor point here uh, and, and whether it's actually going to work at all in, in terms of the Australian link. Um, so just very briefly, let's maybe move over to, to Five Eyes. Um, which, of course, is uh, an intelligence sharing arrangement between uh, five English speaking uh, democracies, uh, the US, the UK, Canada, Australia and, and New Zealand. Um, for the historians among you, and Jamie will love this, of course, it involved uh, it evolved during the Cold War as a mechanism for monitoring the, the Soviet Union, as was, and, and sharing classified uh, intelligence. Um, and I think in some sense, it's, it's, it's a very successful uh, intelligence alliance. Um, but AUKUS is going to be the second major setback uh, that Five Eyes has had um, very, very recently. Um, I'll remind you of the first one, um, although I'm sure you don't need reminding. Uh, four of the Five Eyes uh, recently condemned uh, China's uh, treatment of the Uyghur population in, in Xinjiang uh, province, and they expressed a concern over, over China's uh, de facto military takeover of the China, South China Sea. Uh, and its suppression of democracy in Hong Kong and uh, the threatening moves towards Taiwan. One of the five eyes didn't get on board, and that's New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand uh, re refused uh, and said that it was a nation that prided itself on respect uh, for human rights, uh, but declined to join uh, in Western condemnation of Beijing and said it felt uncomfortable, quote unquote, uh, with expanding the alliance's role by putting pressure on China in this way and preferred to pursue its own bilateral relations with Beijing. Um, this didn't really make national headlines, but this is a big development. That's a big crack uh, in what up until now has been a very successful um, intelligence alliance. And now you've got AUKUS as well, because what it very neatly does is it leaves New Zealand on the outside along with, and I, I, it pains me as a Canadian to say this, it really does, along with Canada. Um, so that's two big cracks in, into Five Eyes. And I wonder whether that may be the death knell to some extent um, of that uh, particular um, forum. I know we've seen the pop-ups of lots and lots of mini forums, um, but I don't know really how effective Five Eyes can be at this point. Um, certainly Australia's uh, federal government in, in Canberra uh, vetoed a major Chinese investment in the state of Victoria, which was to become part of Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so now it really, it's put Australia and New Zealand, I think to some degree um, at odds as well. Let's come briefly to China. Um, China, of course, condemned the agreement as extremely irresponsible. Uh, its spokesman uh, said it seriously undermines regional peace and stability and intensifies the arms race. Now that's interesting um, because I wasn't aware up until they'd stated that, that there was a really explicit arms race at this point. So somebody in China feels that there's an arms race and then somehow this has contributed to it. It's rather chilling to see it in black and white. Um, China's embassy in Washington uh, accused uh, the uh, countries involved of a Cold War mentality and also ideological prejudice. I'd like to come back to this in the Q&A if we can. Um, and as, of course, you know, the pact created uh, a row with France, a massive row, which has lost a deal with Australia to build 12 submarines, although there is some question as to how finalized that, that deal might have been. Uh, worse, France's foreign minister, uh, Jean-Yves Le Drian, uh, uh, said it was, it was a, you know, a stab in the back, so they're, they're not pleased, um, obviously. It will be said, though, France is really the only European country with any real interest, I think, in Indo-Pacific, so that's, it's, it's, it's not surprising. Um, but I think there's some very real issues there. Um, I'd like to just maybe finish with a bit of uh, in domestic critique from Australia, because it's, I don't think Australia is massively as on board. I wouldn't want to paint it in too homogenous um, colours. Um, I'll just remind you that the former Australian Prime Minister, Paul Keating, actually has completely denounced AUKUS uh, and has said uh, that it's uh, like throwing toothpicks at a mountain. Uh, in terms of how effective the submarines as a deterrent 
uh, are going to be in terms of Australia's relations with China and more broadly, um, Australia's relations uh, as a regional power. Um, and he made an interesting distinction between presence and power um, that we can, certainly, um, we can certainly follow up. He also dismissed the credibility of uh, the UK's own tilt uh, to the Indo-Pacific region, uh, suggesting that Britain is like an old theme park sliding into the Atlantic compared to modern China, said Keating, who was Australia's prime minister from 1991 to 1996. Um, so I think not all is well, uh, even within the Australian um, sort of security uh, um, structure, if I can put it like this. Um, and it does bear thinking about just how uh, legitimate and, and uh, uh, viable, I, 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 if I can use those words, uh, AUKUS is going to be in the future. So I'll finish there because I'm really interested to see what Dylan's going to have to say and very much look forward to the questions following. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor. And I think now that our submarines are not as downplayed by Professor Hadfield. <laughs> I'm, I'm convinced to buy one. This is no worry. Okay, good that uh, she convinced us. Um, and uh, last but of course not least, uh, Mr. Croissant, the floor is to you. First of all, I would uh, like to thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, just four months ago, I probably would have been in the audience there watching the rest of this panel speak as a student, either um, maybe dozing off after a full day of class or perhaps if they're in person, um, looking forward to the drinks promised afterwards. Um, as a member of the student, st student society, um, sorry to disappoint Amelia here, I probably would have been one of those focusing on the student aspect instead of the society aspect. Um, regardless, uh, the fact that I'm here is I suppose a testament to some hard work and a little bit of luck. <clears throat> um, and I feel very fortunate. Um, it's always difficult being last uh, and especially being last following excellent re re remarks. Um, it's also uh, very difficult to be both uh, European and American in this um, AUKUS affair. Um, anyway, uh, in, in these opening remarks, I'd, I'd like to um, make three points about what AUKUS means for the EU's role in the world, um, and in particular implications for the EU's Indo-Pacific strategy and the forthcoming strategic compass. Um, first, both AUKUS and the messy withdrawal from Afghanistan, as was referred to, demonstrate that the EU as a bloc is still considered second fiddle by the US. Um, and that's when push, push comes to shove, because there is there's lip service paid to cooperation when times aren't hard, but when times do get hard, um, this, this, uh, this disappears. And so this does demonstrate um, the basic need for strategic autonomy and security and defense at the EU level. But uh, the EU lacks the necessary political unity to even put forth strong statements. In, in the AUKUS affair, um, there were private expressions of solidarity among um, EU member states. Um, and these may have put a little Band-Aid over uh, France's attempt to Europeanize uh, this affair, but um, it doesn't seem that there's been any closing of the ranks thus far, at least not from um, member states themselves. Um, there have been some indications from leadership in the EU institutions, however, that um, France has a fair amount of support. Um, the, the AUKUS affair really does reflect, in my view, uh, the US's growing preference to let go of this role as a global policeman and opt for smaller ad hoc arrangements, such as the Quad, such as ANZUS, um, in which the US also isn't bogged down in the diluted consensus that we sometimes see at the EU level. Um, something like PATO, a Pacific Treaty Organization, does not seem to be in the cards and um, much to the chagrin of Asian partners. Um, secondly, I would also be remiss not to mention this, even though it already has been, um, the security-oriented AUKUS affair definitely hijacked uh, attention away from what was supposed to be the EU's cornerstone strategy for the Indo-Pacific. And uh, this, this strategy seeks to chart a third way between uh, US and China antagonism. Um, I think, in my view, this strategy is really the difference between a stable and secure Indo-Pacific, as Emilio was saying, and a free and open Indo-Pacific. 
um, and, and one that is based, grounded in multilateralism and inclusivity. Um, the strategy itself appears to be more, in my view, of a, of a compendium of already existing policies and tools. I think the political significance of it is that they're brought together in an attempt to look at this region in a more holistic manner. There are many factors, actors, layers, and tools that are at play in the Indo-Pacific, and the EU seems to recognize this. There's also more incisive language on China in the strategy, um, though it doesn't rise to the securitizing containment approach of AUKUS, it definitely reflects greater awareness of the threat that China poses to EU interests, particularly uh, freedom of, of navigation in the South China Sea. Um, but for those of you, I think, who dream of a more important EU security provider in the wake of the strategy, um, AUKUS was, was certainly a cold shower. Um, bigger EU member states will continue to safeguard their own strategic interests in the region, and they won't hold back from acting unilaterally if it is impossible to find a consensus at the EU level, or if implementation of the strategy on a day-to-day -day basis does not correspond with the political vision, um, which is, by the way, what has been happening so far. Um, the proverbial side glance, I suppose, is uh, in this regard is toward Germany and their willingness to, um, in the future, sacrifice trade and investment interests in the name of you know, a rising great power such as China. Um, my third point, and this is a more forward looking, um, the, the AUKUS affair underscores for sure the need for um, a strong strategic compass, a draft of which will be released on Monday. And I'm sure Clemens has um, some insights he could give us about its contents um, besides the four baskets and whatnot. But um, I, I, I fear that it, won't, will, it will not be strong. Um, there, is, there is a growing awareness of what you interest in the Indo-Pacific may be, but uh, there aren't the competences um, you know, in, at the EU level, nor the capabilities to back them up. And not only does you lack these capabilities to be considered credible, regardless of European Defense Union initiatives, which seem to be progressing at, yes, a slow but steady pace, um, there, there's, there are some issues with how the strategic compass has been sold so far, and I'm making particular reference to this 5,000 um, soldier initial entry force uh, alluded to by Borel and others, which is essentially an upgrade to the EU battle groups, and which uh, seems to me and many others a pipe dream. Um, there are, you know, the verdict is still out on the exact details of how this initial entry force will be designed. But if it bears strong resemblance to the EU battle groups, which have never been used, then I fear that it won't work. Um, and this is due both to a lack of political will to use them and also uncertainty over who will fit the bill. Um, so two is there a lack of certain capabilities to make the EU a more credible actor um, worldwide, such as strategic airlift capabilities. So in, in other words, and also to maybe respond to Jamie a little bit, um, strategic autonomy and security and defense seems to be very far off. Um, lastly, and to end on maybe a provocative note, uh, which has not been mentioned thus far, um, as the rest of the world is kind of gearing up for great power competition by massively investing in next generation we weapon systems and platforms, um, the EU is sadly still comp contemplating a brigade size uh, in initial entry force. Um, so in, in, in my view, it is time for EU member states to really raise their ambitions and act together rather than paying lip, lip service to this uh, EU strategic autonomy. Thank you very much, Dylan, for uh, for the adding to the previous speaker's remarks and for closing the opening remarks round. Let's say um, I think that each speaker actually has delivered on the promise of uh, what they're they're going to to provide us with in their opening remarks, and all major aspects of the topic have been.
TATS opponent, please China, Russia, the submarines, um, every uh, NATO aspect, the EU strategic compass aspect. And I think it's high time that we open the floor for two questions. And before I open the floor to questions from the, our physical audience, I would like to ask uh, um, the member of our society, Alexander, who helped me with the moderation with our online questions, if he has something to, to ask first, uh, first to our speakers. Okay, um, thank you, Fotini, and good evening to everyone from my side. Uh, first, I wanted to say that I'm really sad that I cannot be on the podium in person tonight. But over the last one and a half years, I think we have all learned to be flexible and to adapt also to the unforeseeable sometimes. And nevertheless, I would like to open the Q&A with a question for Professor Fischer. Um, in the light of the recent completion of Nord Stream 2, we have seen that uh, the foreign policy of Germany, but also of the EU towards uh, Russia and China was characterized by this uh, strategic ambivalence or a kind of zigzag course that was also motivated by economic interests in the East. Will it be necessary for the EU to end this course and clearly side and also decide where they want to stand in this arising systematic conflict, conflict or is strategic ambivalence actually a reasonable approach? Thanks, Alexander, for the question. Let's accept two more questions from the audience. So are there any questions to our speakers? If, there, if your question is addressed to any particular speaker, uh, please do mention so. Otherwise, it's, we, we will decide who will answer to that. So yes. Thank you. This is a question from a retired British diplomat, mainly uh, for Jamie Shea. I listened to all the excellent uh, uh, presentations of the situation that has arisen. And I still cannot figure out what is in it uh, for the UK and what indeed our defense and security pos posture is. It seems to me a massive example of, of what we used to call imperial overstretch which was exposed by the Japanese in 1941. It seems to me we're making the same respect again. Can Britain defend Taiwan? I really doubt it. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Are there any other questions? We can accept the third one and answer as a block of questions. Nothing so. Uh, Okay, so let's give the floor to the speakers. Yeah, Professor Jamie, would you like, I'm sorry, Professor Say, <laughs> you made me say it wrong. Uh, Professor Say, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, many thanks, and thanks very much for the question. Uh, and greetings uh, to the UK diplomat. Um, as I said in, in my opening remarks, I do feel, yes, that there is this issue of overstretch uh, uh, for, for the UK. Um, it does, of course, uh, mean that the UK needs to beef up its uh, maritime capabilities. And that's the intention of the government. I mean, it's no accident that the incoming chief of the defence staff this time around comes from the Navy uh, and not from the Army or, or, or the Air Force. That's the first time the Navy's had a job for several years. And I think that tells us uh, the direction where the Conservative government is going. I mean, they have uh, uh, laid down the new contracts for Type 26, uh, Type 20 three frigates. Uh, it's not going to push the Royal Navy back up to the 300 ships that it was able to deploy at the Spithead Naval Review uh, in 1914 on the eve of the First World War, or, or obviously not, but it will add a little bit of uh, uh, flexibility. It's going to be interesting, actually, to see what kind of participation the UK has with its astute class submarine uh, in the uh, deal with Australia. If the US ends up with its Virginia class submarines, you know, taking most of the technology transfer and most of the money, then the UK may not be rewarded for its diplomatic efforts uh, in, in crafting the AUKUS deal in the first place. But we'll just have to wait and see if it's an existing submarine or a new submarine design, how it all comes out in the wash. Um, so yes, the UK, I think, is going to be like any uh, power uh, dealing with imperial overstretch, taking risks. You know, can it leave the NATO flank open? Does the strategic situation allow while it deploys in the Indo-Pacific, where, you know, in terms of 
or a threat are its assets are best uh, suited at any one time. The problem is, is that the Russians found out, you remember when they had their uh, imperial fleet uh, deployed uh, in the Atlantic uh, in 1902, 1902, 1904, when they faced Japan, is that if suddenly that you get involved in a war against Asia, it takes a hell of a long time to get your fleet back over to the other side of the world. So there's going to be a certain degree of, of risk planning here. Um, that's for sure if the UK really intends to be present in both theatres at, 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 at once. That means, of course, as I've said, uh, from a UK perspective, trying to multilateralize the security arrangements in the uh, Indo-Pacific. You know, the more it can work with France and Germany, doesn't look likely at the moment, I know, uh, but maybe on a bilateral basis, maybe in more sort of regional frameworks outside the EU, but the more it can work with its traditional neighbors uh, to deploy forces, you know, why would the, the UK not sort of have a rotational arrangement with France uh, to keep two ships uh, on station in the Pacific at any one time that would free up two UK ships to spend a year or so in the Atlantic so healing those European wounds I, I think is going to help I think it's also going to help obviously uh, if, if the UK is able to bring in more Asian countries if the quad can be more involved uh, the more the framework is a multilateral one in the region uh, uh, the, the less the US well the US will always be the backbone let's be frank but the more the UK will be able to uh, take the burden off itself and rotate work. Uh, with other partners while still maintaining some kind of influence. So, uh, sir, you are a former diplomat, and I would argue that there is much room for UK diplomacy here in crafting those security arrangements, uh, as well as uh, uh, for the military. Final comment, of course, uh, and, and this was always the case uh, in dealing with the Soviet Union during the Cold War, you know, if your armed forces are stretched, then try to reduce the threat. Uh, the more you can, you know, set up arrangements uh, that effectively build cooperation with China, even while you, of course, have a containment strategy, the more you can, you know, talk about risk reduction measures, um, prevention of incidents at sea, you know, avoiding clashes in the first place, uh, you know, these kind of things, uh, the less likely you are to sort of run into the difficult situations that are going to force you to deploy major forces in Asia and leave uh, Europe at risk. Uh, but yep, uh, it's uh, the UK government that started out nicely by not only having the integrated review, but by upping the defence budget above 2% of GDP. So it started out with a sort of declaration of intent, but, you know, sustaining that over several decades and several governments and several economic cycles without repairing relations with the European neighbours, I think is going to be a challenge. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for your reply and Professor Fisher. Uh, may I possibly uh, go back to the to, to Jamie and, and your question. Um, the overstretching part of the Brit is uh, uh, it might end as a Pyrrhus victory. A diplomatic victory it is anyways, because um, the blaming the, well, re, I'd rather say, giving the French that kick is exactly what they need now. Um, they, they might not be able to issue any fishery devices, uh, but at least they could kick out the French from, from, from AUKUS because they hadn't been part of it, which is nice for them, um, which I can understand, by the way, because uh, they are looking for new land now. They're alone on the, on the waves, which they always want to rule. Um, and as we, as we might find out when, when we take Paul Kennedy with, with Rise and Fall of Nations, it's always the overstretching part. And Possibly the same uh, might, uh, might end up with the European Union. Uh, if we possibly associate the Chinese at the end of the day, um, then we have all in, uh, except the Western Balkans. Uh, but what the Brits are doing today is something I do easily understand. It is their turf. It is their former imperial thinking of you must, you must be there, which is a good idea anyways, uh, but you don't have always to, to, to blame your friends. Um, Jamie mentioned uh, the, the, Russia, the, the Russia, uh, Japanese war. Um, I don't think that the, the Russians lost because of overstretching their fleet. It was simply a terrible leadership of their admiral. Um, and and uh, Togo-san, uh, who, um, who was the admiral of the, of the Japanese fleet, was a marvelous strategist. And by the way, the Japanese didn't even only win on the sea, they have beaten up the Russians on the land which was even more exciting, by the way. It was the first time ever in history that um, an island country has beaten a ter territorial army. And this was, by the way, I do think 
uh, one of the reasons the Japanese lost the Second World War, because they thought it's always the same game, which it wasn't. Um, but what's in for the Brits, we, we will see possibly in 10 years. Uh, in the short term, it does show the Johnson government, the administration that they can do. And British diplomats always have been good in that, which is fine. Now we will see what they will make out of that. Um, to the question of the strategic ambivalence. The first of all, the Germans would say this is not ambivalence. It's a very clear sign of being open to more or less everything. Um, because when you look back, Mrs. Merkel's uh, first stance was we have to sanction the Russians because of Crimea. And at the same time, she said, but there's no trouble uh, to discuss with Putin on North Stream 2. Because we have to distinguish between business and friendship. Um, which brings me back to Jamie saying you should never ever build an, an alliance on an arms deal. Um, of course, it's for, for the Europeans uh, hard to deal with, with Nord Stream 2. On the one hand side, I do understand the, the Germans, why should you pay more if you can get it without paying the Polish, the Baltics and the Ukrainians for letting the gap through. And uh, for the Austrians, uh, it's like a uh, deja vu, because in 2006 in January, when we took over the presidency, we had the first gas conflict or incident between Russia and, and, and the Ukraine. And uh, by the way, this was, I do think, one of the, the best ideas we ever had. We simply invented a new union, the new energy union, uh, because we had no idea what to do with it. And we discussed it with the Russians uh, to open up the gas again. Um, we paid a bit for the Ukrainians, which we do today again. So history comes back. No one will tell the Germans to stop North Stream 2. It might be a case for Mrs. Baerbock, uh, and, and uh, she obviously wants to become a Minister for Foreign Affairs. You can say you do that as long as you're in opposition. But when you run the government, you have to do the best for your country. And no one does understand. Well, there's one thing in history, and I, I, I unfortunately uh, have to revoke the Austrian history. I think we are the only country who built a nuclear power plant station asked afterwards, would you like to have it, people? And they said, no, this is for that. We are the only, <clears throat> the only country having a one-to-one -one museum uh, on nuclear power plant stations. And if they don't open uh, North Stream 2, this would be a shame in the eyes of the Germans. Because you invested so much and you fought so many battles for that, and at the end you give in. So, um, I, I, I don't think that we can't stop that because that's a question of solidarity too. And uh, in the new upcoming coalition, the socialists, obviously, um, at least the part around Mrs. Schultz, uh, Mr. Schultz, uh, are, go Schultz are going fine with that. Um, the liberals uh, with, uh, with Mr. Lindner have anything, nothing against that. Uh, so I think that the Greens can't expect to get everything they want. Um, and for the question of, of uh, energy security, at least one should let it open uh, in case we need it. Uh, and as we all know, I'm, 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 I'm very landlocked, therefore I'm not a specialist on submarines and um, I'm not a specialist on, on gas pipelines. But as far as I've learned, you have to use that thing in order to keep it up. So you will have to start using it. Um, and the European Union, uh, we, we see today, Mrs. Merkel is one of her last missions, is going back to Mr. Putin and to ask him to support us with energy, which I think is not the nicest thing she wants to do at the end of her career, to go back to a Russian on the ground and asking for help. But she does, which you can do when you're not elected anymore. Um, it's it possibly that the last thing she will do for, uh, for, for the energy security of the Europeans. But what we will have to, to do is, and this is my point, it's not a question that we, uh, that we now talk, how, how did it happen and how bad was the damage? We have to have a look that it doesn't happen again. So either the Europeans learn out of that, that we have to build up a kind of common policy. So we trust each other. Um, the Austrians being neutral, the Irish being neutral as long as they can confront the Brits with it, which is easier now, um, with the Scandinavians not knowing what to do. Um, and we have the Russians in front of our doorstep. We can't ignore them, as a matter of fact. And of course, the Trump administration had a different approach, and the Biden administration does have. 
But if the Europeans don't learn to walk on their own feet with their own ideas, um, I wouldn't say this is doomed because this is populism, but then we have to give up the idea of being a key player in foreign political stances. And this is a question of stamina. Either you have it, you don't have it. And when we can learn something from the Brits today, is go through with the idea and look after what's about the damage. Because the cleaning up is done by the others, not by themselves. Alexander, does that answer your question? By the way, it would have been great to see you after one year on video conferences in person, but, but we will still manage that. Thank you. It would be great. Thank you, Professor, for your answer. Thank you indeed for, for your answer. And um, before opening the floor again for questions, I actually have a question myself. And that goes to Professor Hatfield. You mentioned a lot the fact that um, it's, let's say, in, if I'm allowed to use the word, it's weird that Australia was the one to receive these nuclear powered submarines and also to, to be part in a, in a, in a pact that uh, includes the sharing of intelligence and the sharing of scientific um, knowledge and know-how and by the US specifically, and of course by the UK. And my question goes to implicate actually the role of India in here, because of course nothing has been official, but um, I also read about many, many about articles about the reactions of India towards the fact that Australia was included in such a, uh, a deal, including this uh, technological um, connection between um, the UK and the US and uh, Australia. So what could we say about that? That's a question on my behalf. And are there any questions from our physical audience? Seeing none, Alexander, do you have any questions on our virtual um, live stream? Yes, um, there would be one question um, by Christoph. Uh, he asks, um, could AUKUS um, be a launch for a new CATO? Um, I believe he refers to the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, which was dissolved in 1977. Sure. Thank you very much. And I think that goes to Professor Say because he mentioned uh, a comment on that. So uh, perhaps I will give the floor to the speakers to answer. Uh, Professor Hatfield, would you like to go first? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a really intriguing question. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an answer on that and then some, and maybe just preface it with, with, with something else as well. So um, yeah, my, my comment on Australia was, was, was simply that um, the, the, the issues there, as I pointed out, don't make it the most natural of partners. If you really begin to dig down in it, um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure um, if, if it's going to be viable, like if it's going to stand the test of time. And as, as, as Jamie said, these things really do. Um, India would have been a supremely interesting partner to try this deal with uh, for a number of reasons. Um, not only, I think, have we seen the United Kingdom moving more and more close to India, uh, on political levels, uh, trade levels, uh, higher education levels with regards to um, trying to uh, balance equivalences for uh, postgraduate uh, students, something I'm very familiar with, um, but also strategically as well. Um, also, I think just in terms of location, um, they, they could have uh, probably achieved, given the type of submarine that I have taken pains to explain to you about, uh, largely the same uh, maritime based deterrence impact that they could have, that they're uh, allegedly going to get with Australia. And if they really wanted to get a bang for their buck, if the entire point is to sort of, you know, uh, rattle China. Uh, nothing would have been more effective than to to try to try to line up with India, but there are a number of reasons I think they they, they haven't. Um, so we'll have to see whether that comes out in the wash. I'll I'll tell you what's continuing to to worry me on areas uh, that I research on, and that's of course UK relations with France. Um, these are very bad indeed. These are as bad as I've I've seen uh, for a number of reasons, not just because France for Britain remains the microcosm of all things European, um, and to a lesser extent Germany, and relations with the EU are at such a, a, a pitiful relationship at this point, uh, because of the fracas, ongoing fracas over Brexit, uh, but because there's a very real chance, I think, um, that relations with France are going to worsen politically, strategically as well. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that, that uh, France and the UK have a, a, an incredibly long-standing relationship as allies and as partners. 
And what I think we're beginning to see actually may be a fundamental eroding um, of one of the most important connective sinews, if I can put it like this, across the English Channel. And that's, of course, the Lancaster House Treaties, which have been painstakingly put together uh, by high ranking diplomats, including Lord Peter Ricketts, um, to make really sure that um, not just the preeminent nuclear powers in the region, uh, but those with aligned values and structures um, and um, civilizational approaches uh, work and continue to work closely um, on, on the most high uh, quality technology of, of the age. Um, so seeing that erode, I think, is going to be a real problem because it's going to undermine not just um, the sort of uh, proximate relations that have been painstakingly put together between the, the two provinces, if I can call them this, uh, but also because I think it's going to erode France's ability to speak with and for Britain and Britain's ability to continue to be what it's trying to be post-Brexit, and that's a broker power. Uh, this, was, this is an interesting identity. Uh, the UK, I think, has had a, a good opportunity for some time to be a sort of convening power um, and uh, sort of a penmanship, if you like, and a facilitative power. And it's really got no other choice other than to continue that um, post-Brexit. Post but you can't be a brokerage power if nobody trusts you and people are unwilling to come to the table because um, they're really not sure what, what you're doing there. And I think the AUKUS deal has sown degrees of, of, of mistrust that are going to be difficult to shift. Uh, it's easy just to say it's a submarine deal, it's only eight, it's going to take 20, you know, 20 years, et cetera, et cetera. We've all been investing in World War I naval um, uh, sort of analogies here. So let me remind you, it's not just Port Arthur that saw uh, um, J Japan whop the Russians. <laughs> it was in fact in that same year that uh, Britain decided to embark interestingly enough, on eight dreadnoughts on the basis of false espionage evidence collected from the naval yards at Kiel in Germany. Churchill, who was first sea lord at the time, knew perfectly well that the espionage was wrong. And he went right ahead and built them anyway, because he knew that he was going to ultimately need them when, uh, when uh, naval battles broke out between, between Britain and Germany. So there, I think, is a long history of making good use of uh, tactical responses at, at times of high crisis. Um, I'd be interested to hear Jamie's response on that, but I'll just come back to my, my main worry, and that is the dissolution of longstanding security relationships between the UK and France as a result of the fallout from AUKUS. Uh, many thanks to the question, Christoph, that was put to me. You're looking at the clock, I see that we're nearly out of time, so I'm going to have to be super fast on this one. My sense is that uh, uh, you have a military alliance like NATO or, or Seattle, like you had after uh, World War II at the onset of the Cold War, when there is a sense of a revisionist power which is out to seize and conquer territory. There's no surprise that NATO went back to collective defence big time uh, in March 2014 after Russia seized Crimea uh, and put its troops into Ukraine. Um, Seattle was very much, you know, based on the Korean War uh, and the notion that, you know, the Soviet Union and Communist China would try to expand their territorial possessions uh, into uh, Asia. You remember the domino theory of John Foster Dulles. So my sense is that um, if China did something outrageous, like actually invade Taiwan, uh, and it's been gesticulating a lot lately, or seize uh, some Japanese islands, uh, you know, there are these territorial disputes, or do something that, that basically sort of try to uh, uh, occupy somebody else's territory. That would be the sort of the Crimea moment. Uh, the, and we had those moments, as I mentioned, uh, uh, at the onset of the Cold War, which would sort of you know, throw the Asian countries into the arms of the United States and bring about the call for some kind of formal military pact uh, containment alliance vis-a-vis -vis China. But we're not there yet. Uh, China hasn't invaded Taiwan, and hopefully this kind of big nationalist phase that it's going through under President Xi at the moment will, will lapse. Um, we need to engage China to show that AUKUS uh, is not the uh, the child of Australia, New Zealand, or the United uh, sorry, Australia, the UK, or the United States. It's the child of President Xi. You know, if China wasn't throwing its weight around, there would never be uh, the sense of in in Canberra that they have to replace diesel submarines uh, with 
nuclear powered submarines. Uh, and I think that's why I say engaging China and getting the message over that you know, your policies are simply stoking resentment against you and isolating you. And, and you can embargo uh, Australia big time with uh, uh, your prohibitions on beef and wine and all those kind of things. But, the relation, but at the end of the day, the Australians have sold the coal to India. They've sold the beef and the wine to Japan. They're not worse off than they were before. So this bullying tactics are, are simply counterproductive and not serving China's interests. We'll see. I, it's not an easy message to, to ram home. We'll see, of course, how the China-Russia sort of mini alliance develops in the future. But for the time being, I think that what people are looking for in the region is not Seattle, but the OSCE, something like you know the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, whereby adversaries could come together around confidence building, around arms control, around you know, joint activities, common standards, a cooperative security mechanism. I'm sure that if you sort of go to the Asian countries at the moment to say OSCE type structure, a Seattle type structure. They'll say an OSCE if we can, a Seattle if we must, but it really would be the worst possible outcome that we have to do everything that we can to try to avoid. Thank you very much, Professor, for, for professors for your uh, answers. Uh, is there any, uh, Dylan, would you also like to make a comment on these two questions or? bring your, your view to the fore? Sure, I, I, I suppose I'll just um, finish off with another historical reference as that seems to be the trend. Mine, is, mine goes much, uh, much before World War II, um, which is I, I think that the way that the US is managing the fallout in Europe from AUKUS is very reminiscent of the type of balance of power that the US sought between France and the UK in the early 1800s. And um, albeit to a, an accelerated extent, um, and so I'm 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 personally very curious to see how uh, the U.S. will kind of um, uh, deal with these two very important partners of of uh, you know in, in security and de defense, but also in all other major uh, global challenges in, in the coming year or so. Thank you very much for uh, for that. Uh, I think we could open the floor for two more questions. If there are there any by the speakers by the audience? Yes, in the back. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask you on a European perspective about the ongoing things, especially uh, the encroachment from from the eastern side to Russia with the pressure of uh, more than almost 50% of the gas resources come from the two streams. Then also to the uh, yeah, incapability, incapability of uh, the European Union to project their interests into their own neighborhood, not only into their own neighborhood, but now that the, uh, that the UK has left with uh, most of the military advant uh, advantages that the EU had to offer uh, and the French have been, how you said, humiliated on the global scene. Uh, what, what credibility is there to the EU and which projects could be put in place to turn back around the downward spiral? Thank you. Is there any other question? Yeah. Ah, thank you very much. Lawrence Kettle from the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. My question is actually referring to the actual formulation of European policy because of AUKUS. Um, I want to ask general leader speakers, how likely do we, uh, how likely do you think, uh, is it likely that what we could get is actually a unified European policy toward that region? I can see already there's a couple of smiles on that uh, front. Because, for example, with the global strategy and its predecessor, the European security strategy, what we had was not so much a specific strategy, but more of a general wish list. And are we in danger of that being repeated from the Indo in the Indo-Pacific region for the European Union, um, and then the European Union basically giving its blessings to certain individual member states as actions like France and possibly the Netherlands or Spain uh, in the region, or do you think there is actually a potential for a collective, meaningful 
strategic document for the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that uh, judging from the laughter coming from my right side, <laughs> the floor is yours, Professor. No, no, those who know me, I, I do like smiling. It's better than looking nasty. Um, first of all, because I think it was, it was uh, um, um, at the very beginning, someone asked about the, the Jumbo Summit on Monday, which is coming up on the 15th. Defense ministers and foreign ministers are together. Whatever we do from now on, we, we shall not allow AUKUS that it does hijack everything we do. That's an incident. Well, things happen. Uh, of course, we have to learn out of that, but, but we can't tell us every single day how bad this was, how humiliating this was. And, and, and sometimes the Europeans are quite good in always telling us how bad the world is. Yeah, then change it. It's a matter of fact. And we do have the means, we do have the brain, uh, but we do need action. And what we are extremely good in is a Byzantinic uh, text we, we do in the council. And, and, and if you read them, this is incredible. Uh, I'm doing this since uh, a couple of years. Um, and, and I look back in our presidency, the last time when we started writing the conclusions of the, of the European summit, um, this is an art in itself. You, you need a lot of knowledge to write such a sentence and, and to find the end of the sentence, by the way, even if you start it. Uh, so we, we, we really shall not allow ourselves to be hijacked by AUKUS. And when they meet on Monday, and they shall set an agenda, and the strategic compass, uh, Dylan has talked about it, uh, Jamie, um, and, and, and Amelia, we all talk about the strategic compass we have, and we do need that. But we shall give our own agenda. And the Europeans sometimes are looking too, too much to the left, to the right. What the Russians are doing, the, what, what the, the United States of America are doing, what the Chinese are doing, we shall set our own agenda. We are not that small. We're not a spot on the map. We talk about 420 million people. One thing is for sure when the Brits left us, and they didn't leave us quite unarmed, but they do leave us. We are blind on half an eye now because uh, the Brits don't share their knowledge within the framework of the European Union anymore, which does mean that there are some member states of the EU who are not member of NATO are not allowed to get that qualified information, as a matter of fact, which does mean you have a new Europe of two dimensions and two speeds. You have those who have to grab information, others who, who have the information. So this is something which is definitely uh, able to weaken some position. And when it comes to neighborhood policy, which was your question, um, what are we doing in the neighborhood? Well, first of all, um, we, we have a very delicate situation. A lot of member states are obviously tired of enlargement. On the other hand, we have one, uh, one member state that even left the union, but there are a lot of knocking at the doors. The question is, do you want to have them in? And the answer is, it is too late to answer that, to, 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 to put that question on the table because we already answered that question. We invited all of them. And by the way, as long as they are European on the soil, they have the right to apply for membership. And you can't always play the carrot game by telling them after five years, well, you have done a lot now, but the, you know what? We ask for more. And you can do that because we have learned out of the last en enlargement. And the last enlargement, I wouldn't say that it went wrong, but. Um, it showed us that uh, both sides have to be fully prepared for membership, those who are in and those who join. And when you, I, I wouldn't say that, that uh, the Indo-Pacific region is uh, the most pressing problem we have by the moment. If I would, if I would be asked on Monday, and, and my minister possibly will ask me, but I, I won't give an answer on that, because uh, uh, it's very easy. We have the Balkans on our front step. And if we can't so the Western Balkans incident, in the next couple of months, the Chinese are buying everything. They're an all out buying visit down there. Russia is playing the Pan-Slavic card again, not only in Serbia, but now they're in Bosnia. And if Bosnia is exploding, then we really have a lot of troubles because we can't send forces in by the moment because there's no force available. And uh, when our high representative is talking about a rapid engagement force, 
Fine, we do already have them. They are called battle groups, but we don't use them because they are not for an all-out war. That's not the idea of the battle group so far. Uh, and what, what's happening in Bosnia-Herzegovina is a tragedy. It's a real tragedy because we looked at that, at that part of the Balkans for years. And we thought the Dayton Agreement is, is super for that. Uh, we never ever asked them. And, and all of a sudden we do see that the, the Bosnian Serbs simply take their chance and say, fine, we hijack the whole agenda. We dissolve Bosnia-Herzegovina. And at the end of the day, it, it reminds me, but I haven't been there, therefore I can't say it reminds me, uh, but history comes back again. It's, it's, it's the summer of, of, of 1914. It's again Sarajevo. And we still haven't learned out of that. And you can't contain a burning fire and it starts getting burning quite heavy down there. So, and Turkey is, is intervening down there, uh, taking again, the Muslims under their umbrella. Either we offer something or we withdraw, but you can't be half in there. So yes, you can't be half pregnant. Either you are or you're not. And so if, if we, we, we tend to try to solve problems who are far away, and the Indo-Pacific is quite far away. And, and I don't think that many member states have any real idea what to do down there. The French have. The Dutch possibly have because of their history. Um, but ask a Luxembourger, ask an Austrian. Well, we had, the, I think, but we were one of the most successful uh, um, countries when it comes to sea battles. We only fought one and that we lost, and then we won and then we stopped with that uh, at Lissa, uh, which is quite a good tactic. Um, but otherwise, we don't have any idea what to do. So we, we, we rely upon the others who have an expertise but we have around our doorstep a burning fire. And uh, those who, who are kind of old enough and remember uh, the 1990s down in Bosnia-Herzegovina, this is one of the most cruel wars we ever had on European soil. And in some parts of the Balkans, you're not allowed to say that it was atrocity, it was genocide, because some don't accept it even. It was around our corner. So uh, I think we should start solving our backyard and then step by step go forward and then still we can rely upon um, new alliances and everything else uh, a friend of mine uh, a portuguese uh, told me something quite nasty um, it was on the flight after the uh, after the um, the lisbon uh, negotiations you know what we europeans don't have a foreign policy we have an expanded neighborhood policy <laughs> Uh, it sounded nasty at the time, and I don't think it was that badly meant. But solve what you can solve, and then go forward for the next point. And, uh, and my, my last point to that is, what I don't like with AUKUS is, is not that someone had to be kicked out of a, of a business. This is not the point. This happens every single day. But the crack in the confidence amongst members and, and allies, this is what really turns me very much down. And I do see the Monday uh, uh, summit already being kind of hijacked with that because the French have to react and the French will ask for solidarity. But you can't sink the British fle fishery fleet anyways. And this is not an answer because we have to come to terms. Uh, and this is what I said when I say uh, at the very beginning that the Chinese and the Russians uh, might have a sardonic smile, of course, it didn't cost them anything. We destroyed our confidence amongst each other ourselves. So with these friends, you don't need any enemies. Uh, and, and this is something uh, I don't, I mean, possibly the Americans and the British didn't foresee the aftermath of that. One could have seen that, but uh, it was so tempting to do it. And um, I think we will suffer from that for not only a couple of months. Uh, that's a tragic with the whole thing. Thank you very much. And perhaps I would ask for us, the speakers, maybe for a general closing remark, just as uh, Professor Fischer just did. So who wants to jump in? 
That's a penny. Excuse me for jumping in first and not to make any closing remarks. I apologize, but I've got a dinner rendezvous and I know we've gone a bit over time, which is absolutely fine. Uh, all good, all in the name of the debate, but I personally will have to take off. So uh, my one minute of closing thoughts, I uh, give to uh, either Amelia or Dylan uh, with total generosity. They'll probably make much better use of the time than me, but just to say, thank you very much indeed. Very enjoyable. And again, great organization. Thank you for inviting me. Good night to all. Guten Abend and bis nächstes Mal. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for joining us and for your insights. So, uh, Professor Hatfield, would you like to go first? I'd be happy to. I also need to go quite soon, so I will. I'll make this uh, very, very quick. Um, it, it's a it's a good question. I, I think what I would like to do is simply um, uh, point us all in the direction. Um, of the EU strategy for cooperation um, in, in the Indo-Pacific. And I think the ambassadors made a, a couple of points in, in the sort of general uh, region of that. Um, the, the, the main elements, which I think to some extent talk about the, the, the project that you were asking, what projects can we put in, in place uh, for the European Union's Indo-Pacific strategy? I'll just name them very quickly. There's seven priority areas, sustainable and inclusive prosperity. So it's prosperity driven, green transition, ocean governance, digital governance and partnerships, connectivity, security and defense, which is sixth out of seven, security and defense, and human security. Um, and just it's explained eff effectively as an invitation. Okay, the, it's the EU strategy is an invitation to our partners in the region to address together common challenges and uphold international law and defending values and principles to which we are committed. So I, I'm going to I'm going to leave it there, I think, because there, there are attempts, I, you know, by the European Union to have a consolidated stance as an actor, as a presence, not a power, I think, as a presence in this in this region. Um, but it, it's not going to be able to stand the test of time if it's not stapled on in a multilateral way within the compass, as, as Jamie correctly said, um, and multilaterally with, within NATO. And I think the EU is, is beginning to drift away from you know, some of those strategic principles. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a wonderful uh, event, a wonderful evening. It's been a privilege to hear the, the other three speakers. Um, and I look forward to coming back and, and uh, to Vienna in person at some point in the near future. Thank you. We would be glad to have you in person and not have this Zoom situation going on. And uh, Dylan, the floor is to you. Uh, well, well, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for the, organizing this great event. Um, I would want to echo what Amelia just said and add my own little twist to it, which is the EU must act multilaterally in order to amplify, multiply its presence in the Indo-Pacific, yes. Sure, but in order for the Indo-Pacific Indo -Pacific not to become an, um, you know, an exercise in futility, um, the, the EU really must build up its own capabilities at home. And um, so what, while I understand um, skepticism about the French and their calls for more solidarity and whatnot, um, I think that it would be right also to listen to them when they say, listen, we need to build up our capabilities. We need to try to make the EU a more important um, actor in the defense realm. And we can do this through certain initiatives um, at the European level, such as PESCO um, and such as the European Defense Fund possibly. Um, and we can do this also by raising our level of ambition. And I see I, I um, piqued um, Clemens's attention for a second there. Um, uh, and, I, and I wonder why, but um, anyway, thank you so much for this, uh, this fantastic event. And um, I hope to um, be at the Diplomatic Academy in person sometime soon. Thank you very much both for your closing remark. And uh, of course it would be, it would be a great uh, idea to have you there maybe for our next event. Generally, let me extend a big thank you to all our speakers, even though two of them have left the room or the virtual room, let's say, but of course, 
Uh, it's also the time difference with the UK. Uh, generally, thank you very much uh, to both of you present here and to Alexander, of course, and to my team for organizing this event. And of course, to all of you for being here and to our virtual audience. I don't know where the, yeah, the camera is there. And to the virtual audience for, for joining us here uh, tonight. And uh, we look forward to many more events like that, of course, uh, should the COVID situation permit to have uh, to have such events and in person and with all the speakers in person. Uh, let me just inform you that due to COVID situation, we will not be having the drinks that we planned, but un unfortunately, of course, but of course, the, some discussions or networking can take place. I mean, uh, this allows for uh, social distancing to, to take place. Um, let me also inform you that as a society, we also have an online conference next week. So you see where we're trying to be as active as possible. Um, and uh, this conference will be online, as I mentioned, so uh, everyone can join from wherever, whatever uh, time zone you're, you're in at that point. And it, it involves the topic of women, peace and security. So both the women, peace and security agenda of the United Nations Security Council and also the uh, gender equality aspect of women in positions relevant to international security and defense policies around the globe. So we'd be happy to welcome more of you there. Uh, you will find the links to, to this event as to today's event in our website on Facebook. Um, so we would be happy to welcome you there. And again, thank you very much, uh, dear Professor and Dylan to you and uh, to everyone here.